to the weapons of mass destruction, suffice it to point out that we have documentary evidence now, not only that they were not there, but the president knew they were not there eight months before the invasion of Iraq. And that documentary evidence comes in, in the form of minutes from a meeting in 10 Downing Street where Prime Minister Blair was briefed on sessions in Washington that his chief of intelligence held on the 20th of July, 2002. The report was, the President of the United States has decided to make war in Iraq. Uh, the war will be justified by the conjunction of weapons of mass destruction and terrorism. Uh, translation from the British. Uh, we will say that Assad Hussein has all kinds of weapons of mass destruction and that he's likely to give them to terrorists. And then the final sentence, the, the coup de grace, at least for us intelligence analysts, uh, the intelligence and facts are being fixed around the policy. Now, for the next two days, Fox News tried to tell the American people that fixed means something completely different in British usage. <laughs> and so I called my friend Harry in London. I said, Harry, tell me what fixed means. Tell me what Right, what's the matter with you? Just tell me what fixed means. He said, well, you, you fix a horse race, you, you fix an election. What's, what's become of you? I thought, thank you very much. <laughs> and I have a special kind of thing about fixed because I used to play basketball at Fordham. And my best evening was a, a defensive uh, job that I did on NYU's high score. He was averaging 28 points and I held him to 13. And I got some accolades for that. And guess what? Three, three years later, I read in the sports section of the New York Times that this star at NYU was shaving points. He was fixing the game. Okay. So I have this personal thing about fixed. And please don't let that. <laughs> please don't let that get out of this room. Okay. I still like to be remembered as the fellow that held this guy at 13 points. The other uh, big excuse for the war, of course, was the so-called tie between Al-Qaeda and, uh, and Iraq. Uh, the insinuation being that Saddam Hussein had something to do with 9-11. Now that was, in my view, unconscionable preying on the uh, very real trauma we all felt after 9-11, deliberately associating uh, Iraq and Saddam Hussein with it, even though there was no evidence, no evidence, I repeat, there was no evidence at all. And most of my CIA former colleagues hung in there tough on that one. They didn't do so well on the weapons of mass destruction, but they knew there was no evidence of this tie. And to watch the president and others uh, put out this, this myth that Saddam Hussein had something to do with 9-11 was, was unconscionable. Before, at the time we invaded Iraq, 69% of the American people thought that Saddam Hussein had something to do with 9-11. And a recent poll indicated that 85%, 85% of the Americans serving in Iraq believe that to be the case. Now, these are consequential lies, folks. We need to call them lies. Um, what do I mean? I mean, uh, one of the early incidents that is in indelible in my memory was a private first class uh, who somebody took a shot at in the marketplace in Baghdad and uh, he didn't know where it came from so he sprayed his machine on fire over the whole crowd. Okay. There was a British journalist there and he followed him back to the barracks and he said, uh, he said, don't you feel a little funny about what you just did? And he said, no, I don't feel funny at all. And he took out of his flight jacket a picture of the burning towers, the Twin Towers, and he said, I'm not supposed to say this, you know, I'm not supposed to say this is payback, but it's payback. Come to me to my bunk. Over his bunk was a bigger picture of the flaming Twin Towers. So these are consequential lies, folks. I've never seen the like of it in all my government service. Now, um, I would like to kind of talk a little bit about how a person in the Judeo-Christian Judeo uh, uh, tradition uh, looks at this kind of thing, or should, in my view, should. Um, I, guess, I guess I'd like to refer back to uh, what I'd learned. I 
was teaching Sunday school in the Catholic parish where I worshipped in Washington. And they decided that I might be a little heretical, so they sent me off to Georgetown University for a gentleman's master's degree, okay? mm -hmm. which means no thesis, but lots of courses. And you know what I learned? I learned that this Yahweh from the Old Testament and Jesus of the New really care only about one thing. One thing, that is that we do justice. And in amidst all that, uh, there was a moral theologian from Marquette who came to speak to us, the East Coast Conference on Religious Education. I remember it like it was yesterday. And he had been asked to talk about uh, uh, the keynote on peace and justice. And he said, no, I'll never, I'm, I'm sorry, I won't do that. And the organizer said, wait a second, this is your shtick, you know, this is your, what's the matter? He said, well, I, I will, if you ask me to talk about justice and peace, I'll be delighted. But I will not talk about peace and justice because justice comes first. And peace is simply, in the biblical sense, the experience of justice. So please don't get them mixed up, he said. If you change the title, I'll be delighted to come. And he did. And his speech was unforgettable. And so what about this justice? Well, you know, one of the uh, one of the uh, most proud moments I've had as a Catholic was when the U.S. bishops, Catholic bishops, faced up to the problems in our economy in this country and, uh, and addressed the question of what the preferential option for the poor means. They faced right into it. These were bishops appointed by good Pope John XXIII. We have a different breed now. But, but uh, what they said was this. We're going to tell you what the preferential option for means. This is what it means. No one, no one is, is entitled to amass still more of what he or she doesn't need when others lack the basic necessities. Now, I mean, that was not real new. I mean, Thomas Aquinas said that, but it was big new and very new in this, uh, this uh, climate, and they took all kinds of flack for that. But uh, what I'm saying here is that uh, Justice has got a reign in this. And if you look at the Bible, what uh, the Hebrew scriptures and the Christian scriptures talk about are the Anawim and the fact that the dispossessed, the hated dispossessed, enjoy priority in God's reign and should in ours. And the rich, what about the rich? Woe to the rich. That's what the good word, good news says, doesn't it? Now, who's the rich? Well, I think the best definition of the rich is anyone who is not worried that on this day next year you'll be getting lunch or not. I think that probably includes all of us. Now, in justice we have the question of how we distribute things. And uh, it was really interesting for me to learn Relatedly, that George Kennan, one of my heroes, uh, ambassador of the Soviet Union, the inventor of the, uh, of the uh, deterrent uh, strategy, that in 1948 he wrote this The United States comprises only 10% of the world's population, but we dominate 50% of the world's resources. And so, uh, we can't get carried away with a lot of this civil liberties uh, jazz. Uh, we can't get carried away with these extraneous considerations. What we need to do is to be able to protect, project enough power to hang on to that 50% of the world's resources, even though we're only 10% of the world's people. 